The topic of the last days, or the end times, is always intriguing, and it's amazing that there is a division even in and amongst the church about whether or not we are even in the 11th hour. However, I would like to draw your attention to 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3 to 4. In the Amplified Translation, the Bible says, First of all, know, without any doubt, that mockers will come in the last days with their mocking, following after their own human desires and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? What has become of it? For ever since the fathers fell asleep in death, all things have continued exactly as they did from the beginning of creation. Now if I may ask you a question, how many mockers do we have in this present day? People who do what they want to do out of arrogance and pride. People who think they are intelligent and in fact they stand to try and reason against the Bible. Because as we've just read, a mocker will question the coming of the Lord. They will question the promise of Christ's return. They will question the promise of Jesus Christ returning for the church. A mocker will question the validity of God's word and say, Our ancestors are dead and buried, yet everything is still the same as it was since the beginning of time until now. Yes, we all know about the obvious signs of the last days. We know that men will be lovers of self. We know that dangerous times will come and there will be famines and pestilence and rumors of war. But did you know that mockers are a sign that we are in the last days? People who question the coming of the Lord are a sign that we are close, that we are near. Where is this Jesus you speak of, they'll say. He didn't show up in the 80s. He didn't show up in the 90s and he still hasn't shown up. So where is this Jesus you speak of? That's what a mocker will say. And I need you to understand this because a different translation of 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3 to 4 says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. A scoffer and a person who mocks are one in the same thing. But the point is this, one of the clear signs that we are in the last days is that people will come. They will write articles in newspapers, they will write their comments, they will stand and speak to crowds, and they will question where is this coming of Jesus Christ that was promised. They will question where is Jesus Christ since you Christians keep saying he is coming. So what should you and I do when we see these things? When a scoffer mocks you and voices his or her disagreement, when they ridicule you, what should you do? Because believe me, they will put up an argument that tries to persuade you to see things from their perspective. However, Psalm chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You are blessed when you don't sit and entertain 
scoffers. Do not sit with them or break bread with them. Of course, do your Christian duty, which is to love all people and share the gospel of Christ, but do not sit or get into a state of being relaxed with a scoffer. They will pull you down. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. The dangerous thing about a scoffer is that their sole aim is to make you doubt. They plant seeds of doubt. That's their mission. It's simply to spread doubt. They want you to question everything about the Lord. They want you to question 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17, which says, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. A scoffer will want you to question that. They will want you to question Revelation chapter 3 verse 10, which says, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. They want you to question the word of God. But we should resist such a person. Protect your faith. Protect yourself by not exposing yourself to people who purposely come to trip you up. Instead, focus on living a life that is pure and pleasing to Jesus Christ. Focus on doing all you can to put this flesh under subjection. In fact, the Bible tells us how to prepare for the coming of the Lord in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And it reads, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. We as children of God should be found spotless and blameless, in peace, patiently waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. We should be found to be living a life of obedience. We ought to be found walking by faith and not by sight. We ought to be found with no idols in our hearts. We ought to be found praying always. We ought to be found with our minds fixed on things above and not on things of the earth. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. The combination of the blood of Jesus and your testimony is powerful enough to crush and overcome the devil. So don't ever underestimate the power of your testimony. And your testimony can simply be about your journey in becoming a Christian, how God took you from darkness to light. Whatever it is that the Lord has done for you, testify about it. Our testimonies have the power to overcome the enemy. It is the faithful testimony of Jesus Christ that has the power to destroy the works of the devil. Imagine if everything simply went dark and you had no sight, no vision. No sense of security, no sense of direction. This would no doubt be a scary experience. Not being able to see your next step. Not being able to identify what's in front of you, what's behind you or around you. 
You see, having no sight can be a frightening experience. And the reason I'm describing this physical state of blindness is because as people of faith, as born again believers, we are told to walk by faith, not by sight, not by physical sight, that is. And so if we're to walk in the spirit, as Galatians 5 says, then we must realize that perception through our five senses alone is deceptive. And I find that all too often. Many of us know the verse about walking by faith and not by sight. Many of us know the verse that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And yet, many believers are still blind in the spirit. Many have no sight or vision. They have no sense of security because they rely on physical locks and doors alone to protect them instead of walking by faith and believing Psalms 91 and 11 which tells us that God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Too often, people have no sense of direction because they rely on the physical things to direct and guide them in life instead of walking by faith and believing that God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Many Christians are in this state of spiritual blindness where they can't see the doors of opportunity that God has lined up simply because they are not looking through the lens of faith. And the worst thing about it is that many believers who perceive and believe only through physical eyes will end up wrestling with other people, with their friends, co-workers, and so on, without realizing that we wrestle not with flesh and blood. We don't fight with people. We fight the spirit behind them. We fight principalities and powers and dark forces who will hide behind people. Just consider this for a moment. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 22 to 23, the Bible reads, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus heard what Peter said, looked at Peter, but he rebuked the devil. He rebuked the devil. You see, there are times when you have to realize that you're not fighting the person, but you're fighting the demon behind the person. You're fighting the spirit behind the person. And Jesus knew this. He knew this because he walked by faith, not by sight. And you will never discern a spirit behind a person if you're walking by your physical eyes instead of your spiritual eyes. Spiritual blindness means you'll never discern the demon behind the person if you're walking in the flesh. Jesus looked at Peter but spoke to Satan. He saw through Peter and discerned the spirit that was operating in Peter. Some of you need to pray for this type of discernment because you're fighting the wrong thing. You're fighting the person when you should be fighting the spirit behind them. And you can only see this, you can only perceive this if you are connected to the spirit realm. Only when your spiritual eyes of discernment are opened can you see who or what is really attacking you. The Bible also talks about sight in many different ways. The sight that a Christian needs to have is divine sight, supernatural sight, spiritual sight, sight that is brought by walking with the Holy Spirit. And we need this because, firstly, we walk by faith, not by sight, meaning that without faith, you're walking blind as a Christian. But secondly, we need our spiritual eyes to be open so that we may be able to discern. Without discernment, you're walking blind as a Christian. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 says, And no wonder. For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light.
How will you be able to tell a deceiving devil posing as an angel from a real angel sent from God? You need discernment. Matthew 24 verse 24 says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Let's not underestimate the Bible's warning here. Prophets will appear, and they will perform great signs and wonders to deceive, the Bible says. Meaning that a Christian who's spiritually blind will run and say that this is a great miracle by God, but they will be deceived. But a believer who has spiritual eyes and ears will see a miracle, but they will be sensitive to the spirit behind it. So what exactly did Jesus mean when he said, the eye is the lamp of the body in Matthew 6, 22? When you understand why the Lord made this statement, only then can you begin to understand why it is so important to have your spiritual eyes open, your good eye open. Our eyes are the entrance to our hearts and minds, and as such, they provide a doorway to our very souls. It's not just the eyes that we see clearly, but eyes that also perceive clearly. It's not only what we see, but how we perceive what we see that makes the difference between godliness and ungodliness, between light and darkness. Bad eyes are stingy, they lust, they idolize material possessions, money, and wealth. Bad eyes produce spiritual darkness. Good eyes walk by faith. Good eyes don't see the situation around them, they see the God in the situation. Good eyes see the obstacles, but they also see a God who can overcome obstacles. Good eyes see the sin and hates the sin, but loves the sinner and sees their soul. A good eye walks, sees, and perceives by faith. When we walk by faith, we are walking in the confidence of God's word. But the devil wants you to believe only what you can see through your physical eyes, when in fact, the unseen spiritual realm is more real than what you can see. So let me encourage you today. Pray that you may be given sight, spiritual sight, spiritual discernment in order to navigate this life. Faith must be part of our everyday lifestyle. When we walk by faith, we are expressing to God that we have confidence in Him and His Word. Walking by faith should be part of our daily routine. The more faith you have, the larger God will grow in your sight in your vision, in your life. To walk by faith requires that we become familiar with the promises that God has given to us. The Bible is filled with promises for believers. Nothing is more encouraging or nurturing to our faith than reading the promises of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so spiritual sight, spiritual wisdom, comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God.